Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the session this morning. Thank you for joining us. Given all the things that I know you could be doing, really appreciate you taking time to join us. I trust that you're all keeping safe and following the COVID-19 protocols to keep ourselves safe, and we, we can't emphasize that enough. That said, only some ground rules. And so as part of this uh, ground rules sort of webinar, just to share with you that the webinar is being recorded. All video and audio have been turned off for participants. If you have questions, please type in the Q&A box below. Your questions will be answered by one of the panelists live or responded to at the end of the session. So health and wellness is on almost every mind, everyone's mind at this time. And with, the and with this, the opportunity to expand and indeed diversify the pillars on which the Jamaica economy is based. And so JAMPRO is always looking for areas on which we can partner and develop Jamaica and where we have a real opportunity to develop global business. So mushroom and psilocybin mushrooms in particular is an area we can develop our own expertise and a cluster of health oriented business that looks at research and development, clinical trials, and promoting the health benefits of specific products. We are here to explore that and more today. At this point, I want to apologize to the absence of our beloved uh, president of JAMPRO, Ms. Diane Edwards, who unfortunately will not be able to join us as she has been called away to an urgent meeting at the ministry. That said, it is need my pleasure to fill in as today's moderator. For those, of all, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Norman Nair and I am Vice President of Sales and Promotion here at JAMPRO. We are delighted that we have had close to 200 registrants to this webinar as we see this as a real opportunity for many Jamaicans to explore, especially in a time when as a country, we are seeking new industries to drive our economic recovery. Opportunities abound for Jamaica's farmers, researchers, clinicians, and entrepreneurs to serve the full value chain. Over the past few months, JAMPRA has been working with Wake Jamaica to examine and explore the possibility of building a vibrant and thriving mushroom industry as it relates to the use of psilocybin mushroom as a treatment for mental disorders. And that's it, as a treatment for mental disorders. It is widely recognized that more attention needs to be given to treatment of mental illnesses in Jamaica. Additionally, we want to position Jamaica as a destination for innovative and scientifically sound research that can lead to credible evidence-based findings and medical breakthroughs. We've also been working with our stakeholders, the University of the West Indies, Scientific Research Council, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and believe now is the time. So today's webinar is the start of a discussion. The scientific and medical community explore the scientific justification for the promotion of psilocybin mushrooms in the treatment of mental illness, and also to explore potential opportunities for the development of an industry around us. The panel of speakers have been carefully selected and are all specialists in their fields, in such areas as medicine, healthcare, and also research and development. And so I just wanna share with you uh, the agenda this morning. And, and, and so up next will be setting the stage with Nick Murray. The World of Mushrooms, presented by Pauline Smith. What is Psilocybin by Dr. Olga Chinoles. And Psilocybin Research by Jim Grisby, Dr. James Grisby. We'll have a panel discussion where we'll take it locally uh, that deals with clinical trials and psilocybin potential in Jamaica. That panel discussion will be led by Professor Wendell Abel, and he'll introduce the list of panelists at that time. But for now, 
I want to just turn our attention to our first presenter, um, Mr. Nick. Murray, sorry, who will set the stage for us. Uh, I now hand you over to Nick. Nick? Many thanks, Norman. And Diane, thank you again for uh, organizing this and the entire team at JamPro. It's, uh, it's been wonderful organizing this with you. Uh, and we've really had a great alignment with you on the idea of really positioning mushrooms and the burgeoning mushroom economy uh, to be science-led to be clinically research focused and to really use uh, the best powers of technology and the community here in Jamaica to empower everybody involved to make the best product possible and really position Jamaica as the leader uh, in this burgeoning new industry. We've taken the approach of science first, right from the farm. So the farm in Mandeville has been uh, completely kitted out to GMP standards and we're using the highest grade of technology to ensure that all of our batches are repeatable, uh, that everything is analyzed for psilocybin and psilocin content at our various university partners, uh, UE being one of them. And we're really looking to, to push forward not only psilocybin as a, as a use for helping the mental health crisis that was here before COVID and has unfortunately been exacerbated by COVID, but also the burgeoning industry of nootropics beyond psilocybin and psilocin uh, where we can assist with things like diabetes and cancer and a number of other medical diagnoses that can be assisted with the benefit of medicinal mushrooms. With that said, I would like to thank everybody from UII, from SRC, and obviously Jam Pro, as well as some of our colleagues uh, from North America. We have Jim Grigsby joining us from the University of Colorado, quite an accomplished researcher as well as my colleagues from Wake and Wake Jamaica. We're very, very excited to be working here in Jamaica, working with the community and leveraging a decentralized growing method to ensure that the community is not forgotten as we grow this industry within Jamaica and obviously beyond to the global stage. We have leveraged a decentralized method of growing that will ensure that the, uh, the growers of the community are always involved and it's a female led growing system and we're really excited to show that you can make medicinal mushrooms in a repeatable fashion and with a uh, direct amount of, of psilocybin psilocin within them and synthetic is not the only option with regards to clinical research. We've also taken a technology approach on the actual clinical research side where we use the best of class wearables to ensure that the data we receive from the field and from our clinical research participants is, is, is beneficial and is also able to be published and that we can feed that back to our farm to ensure that what we're intending and what we're hoping to achieve uh, is being achieved on the ground and we can double down. So it's really a science focused approach right from the farm, right to the capsule and into the patient or participant. Again, I'd like to stress that we are very happy to be a part of this event and hope that we can continue and, and do further events with Jam Pro and the ministry and I'm really looking forward to the rest of today. So thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, well said in setting the stage. At this time, I just wanna invite uh, Pauline Smith, CEO of Wake Jamaica, to drive us through the world of mushrooms. So with that, Pauline. While Pauline gets started, I just want to remind everyone to please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A section on Zoom. Uh, we'll get to those questions. Also, it'd be helpful as we go through these various presentations that you might just indicate to whom you were asking those questions. So give an indication, uh, you know, the person that you want to answer the question, uh, given the various presentation. We're thinking to ask the question in between the presentation, but you know, in, in the interest of time, we'll just accumulate all the questions towards and, and just address them at the end of the session. So uh, feel free to ask your questions. That said, 
back over to you, Pauline. Thank you, Norman. Okay. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. This, this is really a very big step in the local mushroom industry, which I think you can trace back to the start in 2010, when then Member of Parliament, Audley Shaw, challenged a small group of women in North Manchester to find something scalable to do with, with bamboo. And so at the root of the modern Jamaican mushroom industry, we can say that bamboo is what forms that uh, this new industry. Um, the game changed uh, when in 2020, Nick Murray came to Jamaica and he would be the perfect customer. Nick brought something that the industry up to that point was missing, and that was market and technology. And while there were several different people working at establishing this industry, it was the, the, the coming home of Wake Network that brought us that market and, and the bigger picture. And Nick's commitment that the women and the poor youth that were now the artisan growers of mushroom in Jamaica would not be left out. That in the, in the wake uh, game plan, poor landless women and youth could continue to form the foundation of growing mushrooms in Jamaica. And what's exciting about mushrooms is that we have been able to take women and youth, whether they are readers or non-readers, and make them artisan growers of mushroom in a decentralized system. But it, I think we need to step sideways and look at what's the history of commercial mushroom cultivation in Jamaica, because there is some mis information on the market. People tend to say that Jamaica is not a mushroom growing country, but I was born and raised in Manchester where the Cobbler Youth Camp is. And in the 50s and 60s, we grew mushroom commercially in that part of the country through the Jamaica Welfare Program. That mushroom industry pretty much faded away when the youth camp system was put out. But in the 80s, and I know Dr. Ardio Barnett is on the panel and she can uh, speak to it, that uh, SRC led an, um, a resurgent, an effort to start a local oyster mushroom industry. But I think we got it kicked up a notch in 2010 when Minister Shaw uh, challenged us to do something with it. Instead of just talking about it, we, we needed to do something with it. In 2011, the Network of Women for Food Security wrote its first um, proposal to food for the poor, uh, to get some support in establishing an income and food security project. And out of that project has grown the modern thrust of the, of the mushroom industry. And many people and individuals and organizations have helped along the way. We've had help from Food for the Poor, USA, the SEBI, JARIJ, even Propel program, which came in somewhere in 2018. They contributed to the growth of the industry by giving classes across the country and handing out some simple equipment. So this industry has been growing slowly until 20. 2018, 2019, when cannabis became legal and we started seeing a flood of interest come to Jamaica with a lot of the large cannabis players who wanted to grow mushroom in Jamaica. Organizations like ECA has also been really instrumental in moving us along the way. For 2019, Denby Show, they, their entire display was about Jamaica being part of a biodiversity uh, economy and mushroom was featured as the cultivation model for that. In 2020, uh, ECA joined forces with Wake Jamaica Limited and we saw, we worked with Dr. Graham, D Damien Graham to write the 
a consultancy service development of commercialization of the Jamaica edible mushroom industry. So there, I, I go through the history because it's really important to say that this is not something, the, the new mushroom industry in Jamaica did not just kind of happen. This has been concentrated work from a number of key agencies and the diligence hanging in there of the of poor women and youth across the rural areas, they've all been part of it. Our mission continues to, to, to be not just cultivating philosophy in Jamaica, but addressing a whole range of different kind of mushroom. What happened when Wake Network joined the table? They brought technology that was not available in Jamaica. They bought the resources. They were committed to building a real life, large GMP standard farm uh, where we could meet international standards. And they came with a roster of different expertise like Dr. Olga and things that we were missing in Jamaica because we did lack some of the challenges in Jamaica was not enough technical uh, support. Jamaica offers some really unique features for growing mushroom all year round. But the same thing that makes us unique is in for growing mushroom is also part of the challenge we have had. Jamaica doesn't have the normal substrates that you use to grow mushrooms in North America. In North America, you have bran, you have straw, you have hardwood sawdust. None of these are available in Jamaica. So we have been challenged over the last 10 years to find ways of converting tall grasses and a variety of interesting substrate into making the food and the conditions ideal for growing mushrooms in Jamaica. The mushroom industry in Jamaica, we can be very proud of because it is a 360 design uh, system. There is no waste. Uh, we are most excited that it is a 360 loop, that starting with our cloning, our sterilizing, how we make spawn, what substrate we use, what we do with it, with the substrate after we've used it, that everything feeds into everything else and there is no waste. We were very inspired in the early days by the Jamaica boiler system. And we understood that poor women and youth did not have the capacity to make the grow bags. And so we put a lot of effort in designing a system that would create our version of the day old chick. And those grow bags could then be handed out to women and youth across the country. All along the way, the, the, the work that Wake Jamaica Limited is doing, the Network of Women for Food Security, the Association of Network uh, of Mushroom Producers, We've all worked hand in hand. And, it's, and there's a lot of people doing things in Jamaica, but I can speak to what has been happening in Manchester and with Wake. I know sometimes they, there is a confusion about whether or not Wake is associated with activities have, happening in Treasure Beach or other places. And those activities are very important to the bigger picture. But I, I, I need everyone to know that where we have been grounded is in Manchester. We are not grounded in in, in what's happening in Treasure Beach or other places. And we are a vertically integrated company that looks after all of the different steps in our cultivation. We have um, micro farmer training centers that are being put up. And that was one of the game changers for us in that instead of spending a lot of time writing proposals and begging for support from different agencies, once Nick, Nick and Wake Network entered the conversation, we then had all the resources to build out the different grow units to support the women to deliver grow bags without looking towards funding agencies for how we were going to fund that. 
we are growing using uh, lemongrass and bamboo and other waste crops. We are growing a wide variety of mushrooms. We are delivering mushrooms to the hotels. We are producing mushrooms that are medicinal mushrooms and psilocybin is just one part of what it is we're doing. The research uh, that is coming back on oyster mushrooms and the statins that it produces, metaki for diabetes, lion's mane, cordyceps. There are just so many exciting things happening in mushroom. And I am especially pleased to, that a little project that started with a group of women wanting to do uh, income and food security that would have a triple bottom line has actually caught the attention of people from far and wide. And when we talk about the triple bottom line, what Wake uh, Network and Wake Jamaica Limited is commi committed to doing is that any community that we enter and leave, the community should be better off in three ways. The women and youth who grow our mushrooms should be better off financially, the environment should be better off and we use the opportunity to improve the society and the social value in that community. The local mushroom industry is a success. From Roundhead Hotel along the coast to Stush in the Bush in St. Anne, across Jamaica in homes, mushrooms grown professionally by our network of artisan growers across the country is finding its way on the table. We are really proud of what we're doing and we are excited that the mushrooms grown now has a market, now has a destination and that we are part of a bigger family that will expand the vision. I thought we were being very optimistic and very ambitious when we started all of this. But what I've learned working with Nick and, and Wake is that when you come together as a group of people across cultures, across social lines, and you have a sheer vision and you embrace each other, you can actually make a difference. So I think it, to have a conversation about Philosophy is important, but to have a conversation about the awesome power of mushrooms to change a country, to change the lives of our farmers, to change the lives of the people who digest the things we make is really a very, very, very exciting thing to be a part of. And I'm very grateful that uh, Jampro, who has been an amazing supporter of my work way back when the, we didn't have much to show, Mrs. Ms. Edwards would find the time to entertain us in our office and point us in the right direction. So this is a really important day for us. We're growing mushrooms, we're heading places, and our farmers are actually earning. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, uh, Pauline, for taking us through that journey of mushrooms in Jamaica. As with so many things, it starts with the women. And I want to just acknowledge and, and recognize that. And, and thankfully for the support of you know, Wakefield Network, the technology that they brought in, and all of your stakeholders along the way that brought us to where we are today. Uh, thanks so much for that, Pauline. So we want to turn now to what is psilocybin? And with us this morning, I want to introduce to you uh, our next speaker. She has over 10 plus years uh, experience in preclinical and clinical research. Uh, she specializes in psychopharmacology, neuroscience, and applied cannabinoid research. She's a neuroscientist and a pharmacist. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Olga Chinolas. Dr. Chinolas, over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Norman, for your introduction. And I'd like to thank Jampro and all the um, 170 people almost who found time to join us. 
and I'll be happy to give you just a little bit of information to help you get a better idea of what psilocybin actually is and why is there all of a sudden this immense interest in this uh, particular confound. Okay, let me share my screen now. Perfect. So as Terry told us, psilocybin, well, mushroom industry in general, and uh, psilocybin mushrooming in particular has been with Jamaica for decades, but it's been with humanity for thousands of years. And uh, we know from historic records that it's been used as a sacred material in cultures around the world, in West, West Africa, in Europe, in Central and um, Latin America. Um, but today we know that all this interest of uh, humanity using it as, as a sacred plant, as a divine plant, um, is due to it containing psilocybin, a plant alkaloid that's derived from a variety of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, you probably heard at some point term magic mushrooms. So psilocybin is what brings that um, magic. Um, as I told you, use of psychedelic mushrooms has been with humanity for millennia, but it's been brought to the Western culture relatively recently. Um, as um, late as in late 50s, uh, they were introduced to the Western culture and it actually coincided with the boom in interest in other um, psychotropic substances. So the interest in this compound was picked up by a major pharmaceutical company, Sandoz, who went to um, isolate the active compound, actually determine what it is, isolate it, and then actually turn it into a pharmaceutical. Um, it may come as a surprise to some of the attendees, but psilocybin um, produced to pharmaceutical grade was available as a pharmaceutical named indocybin in uh, 1960s. That all came to an end um, rather abruptly in 1966 when US banned uh, use of psilocybin and other um, psychedelic substances and then went on to um, classify it as illegal um, as it stays to this day. Um, looking at why psilocybin may be effective in a variety of clinical conditions, which you will hear shortly from myself and other participants, um, it actually works in our brains on the same system where uh, some of the pharmaceuticals that you could be well familiar with, like SSRIs that um, people take for depression, but it works in a different mechanism. So it works on the same system, but it works in a different mechanism. It works in a specific subset of serotonin receptors, so-called 5-HT2A receptors, and we believe that's the site where the magic happens. And I want you to remember that psilocybin is not the only psychedelic drug. So it's a class of drugs and psilocybin is one of its representative. And um, terms psychedelics and hallucinogens uh, are interchangeable and all can be applied to psilocybin and other drugs in this class. Okay, and here, um, just a little list of recent clinical trials. So once psilocybin research and use was, ba uh, was banned in 1960s and 70s. Um, we lived through almost three decades of silence in the area of psilocybin research. 
However, in 1999, the research into potential medicinal properties of this exciting compound has resumed. And as you can see in this little table here, number of clinical studies have been conducted with psilocybin, looking at different indications, particularly in mental health. Uh, for the most part, studies were focused on treatment of um, depression and anxiety, but um, it's been shown that psilocybin can be effective in treatment of other mental health conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder, like addictions and so on. So um, it's, uh, it's not an exhaustive list. Over 30 um, trials in human populations have been conducted by different academic and clinic, clinical research groups around the world. And this is just a representation of the work that has been done. Um, and in reality, the data coming from these clinical trials has been so impressive that FDA has granted a breakthrough therapy designation to two separate groups working on researching the effects of psilocybin in treatment of different modalities of depression. So what this means is that recognizing the immense clinical potential of this substance, FDA is in effect has fast-tracked research into potentially bringing this uh, medication to, to market so that more people can find help in its, um, in its use. And as you can see here, number of academic institutions worldwide are focusing their efforts on psychedelic research. Um, Imperial College in London and John Hopkins Univer University have done a bulk of research in um, this area. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, University uh, Berkeley um, has announced that they would be opening a center for psychedelic research as well. So this is very much um, well-recognized area of interest for academia now in the world. And as I mentioned, the breakthrough therapy designation, just giving a little bit more details here. So there are two separate companies conducting research into um, properties of psilocybin for treatment of treatment resistant or major depressive disorder. And uh, one company that received this designation earlier, they're actually in, uh, they're recruiting patients around the world. So they have, um, I believe 19 centers uh, across the globe that would be conduct conducting this exciting clinical trial. And uh, aside from anxiety and depression, as I told you, there is a number of other indications where researchers and clinicians believe that psilocybin has a significant potential in being effective in treatment of uh, those conditions. So ongoing research is um, happening and it's looking into potential efficacy of uh, psilocybin for treatment of not only mood disorders like depression, anxiety, but also for use in addiction, uh, for use in migraines and headaches, and even in Alzheimer's. So it's too early to say whether um, psilocybin will be effective for all those conditions, but research is definitely there to, to tell us. And what's very important is that psilocybin is not just a medication, it's always a part of the psychotherapy administration. And unlike a traditional pharmaceutical model, where if you are diagnosed with one of these conditions that we discussed, you would be taking a pill a day um, until you get better. With psilocybin, that's not how it works. Um, you take it once or twice, up to three times in um, research conditions. You do it over the duration of several weeks and you always have preparatory 
and integrational psychotherapy sessions before and after. So you take this drug once or twice and you experience the effects that clinical research has shown can persist for up to six and sometimes 12 months and sometimes even longer. So this is truly astounding that you're not confined to taking your pill day by day by day. You go through this therapy session and hopefully you're good for, for at least several months. And this is a very distinct, distinct mode of therapy and it owes to a distinct mode of uh, pharmaceutical action. And contrary to the um, probably popular belief, because if we think that this is a controlled drug, this is a narcotic as it is classified now, it must be very dangerous. But in, um, in reality, we see uh, psilocybin here represented as mushrooms. It is by far the safest compounds um, uh, compared even to things that we can walk into the store and buy today. And not only it's a very safe compound, it has a very low addictive potential. So as you can see, the lower we are, the lower is the dependence to the specific compound. So for instance, heroin clearly would be one of the most addictive substances, but you'll see the nicotine right up uh, out there. And psilocybin has extremely low addictive potential, which um, renders to the safety profile of this drug. Okay, let's skip this. And I'll just briefly tell you that through all the clinical research that's been done in this area, it seems like psilocybin can be quite efficacious in treatment of specifically depressive and anxiety disorders, but there is a potential for its use in addictions, in OCD, in headaches and other conditions. And it's always to be used as a part of uh, psychedelic assisted therapy and it's quite a safe, non-addicting drug. Um, and just on the one very last note, being mindful of the time, as we've discussed, the compound remains illegal, um, but several cities in the US went on to legalize it in their city limits. And it's definitely a rolling snowball because it started just last year in 2019, three of the cities um, claimed that they would legalize psilocybin use. And just, what is it, day before yesterday, uh, we have another city um, added to this list and there is a general interest statewide and uh, even on the uh, countrywide level in US in reassessing the status and the schedule of this compound. And in Canada, where I am uh, presenting from today, psilocybin has been allowed to be used by a certain group of medical patients um, and it just happened in August 2010. And it took, originally it took several months, but now once the process is in, actually every new patient is being approved about every 10 days. And with that, I'd like you to thank for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions after the session. All right, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Chernolas. I hope I, I pronounced that correctly. Uh, thanks, thanks so much Thank for you. sharing. Uh, listen, as, I, as I, I take a sip of my coffee, I, I noted on your chart that, you know, uh, the mushroom, psilocybin mushroom is less addicted than, than caffeine. So, um, you know, that gives me some assurance there as to the possibilities. Um, magic mushroom. Um, you know, 
the, the, the term, you know, give rise to a, a lot of ideas here that, um, you know, one could stretch the imagination on. But what, what I found interesting was the use, active use of um, research centered around the treatment of depression and anxiety related uh, kind of diseases. And, and so um, I'm keen on, on how all that will unfold. And, and so it's, it's also fitting that our next session, our next presentation uh, is on the psilocybin research as more details uh, is unfold or revealed around how we're actually using um, psilocybin um, to, to address some of these medical conditions. And for, for that, I have um, with us this morning uh, a research scientist at the University of Colorado Health Science Center, uh, where he's professor of psychology and professor of medicine in the Division of Healthcare Policy and Research. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am having us, I'm pleased to have with us this morning, um, Professor Jim Grigsby. Uh, Jim, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be able to talk with you today and uh, hope that uh, I'm able to uh, provide you with some information that you'll find useful and, and interesting. Um, some of what I wanted to say uh, overlaps a bit with what Olga has said. And uh, so I'm not gonna go into all of those details. I would like to just go over a couple of her points again, because I, I think they're, uh, they're relevant uh, in ways that are important to consider. So what I'm going to do is share my screen with you. Let's see. Um, all right. So what I wanted to do is talk just a bit about some of the studies that have been done uh, and where things stand with respect to our knowledge of the effectiveness of psilocybin and its its safety profile and that sort of thing. I'm going larger. Okay, so uh, w one of the things uh, uh, Olga uh, very nicely discussed was uh, a lot of the history of uh, psilocybin, which uh, goes back quite a ways. Uh, they estimate that it may have been used by people as long ago as 9,000 years in uh, uh, places in uh, Algeria. And uh, so it's got a, a very long history. It's probably used consistently in some areas of the world for uh, five or 6,000 years. Um, but what's really striking, I think, is the the recent therapeutic use of these things. And um, one reason I think it's useful to um, kind of repeat just a bit of what Olga had to say is to give you an idea of the, the range of different conditions for which psilocybin can be effective. And uh, when you begin to think about it, you almost think, well, this, you know, the idea of magic mushrooms uh, uh, it almost sounds too much like magic. Uh, how can this be that this one drug with uh, kind of strange effects on people's consciousness could be so useful, so beneficial, and yet so safe for a number of conditions? So let me just kind of put that in a context. Um, you know, if I have high blood pressure, for example, there, there are different classes of medications that I might take to control them. And while they may be useful occasionally for other conditions, that's not always the case. Um, some things are very, um, very much developed and marketed and used to treat just a, a specific niche, a medical niche. Certain cancer drugs, for example, are effective for certain types of cancer, but not for others. The difference with 
psilocybin is that there's so many different things it's been helpful for you know so you wonder how could that be um, so the major area of research right now um, and has been for the last uh, 10 years or so is quality of life among people with late stage cancer and there have been studies published first a, a small one by uh, Charles Grobe who's a physician at uh, UCLA, um, then larger studies at Johns Hopkins University by Roland Griffiths and his team there, and then Steve Ross and his research group at New York University have also studied the, the same thing. Uh, I managed to uh, um, become involved in the research that's being done at New York University uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, one of the things I was privileged to be able to work on was a long-term follow-up of patients who had been in their earlier research, which was published in uh, 2016. And uh, what we found was quite interesting, striking, uh, uh, that even uh, as much as several years after completing their uh, psilocybin therapy, uh, people who had cancer and who were still surviving, a lot, a lot of these people would have died because uh, they were mostly stage three and stage four cancer. So um, relatively short life expectancy for some of them. But of the, the survivors, uh, it was pretty much the case that the effects of the initial treatment persisted after quite a long time. And those effects really were a decrease in depression, a decrease in what they refer to as existential distress, which basically is uh, the concern about the, the end of your life approaching, uh, losing your family, your friends, losing everything. Um, people with cancer who've been through this treatment find they're much less preoccupied with that sort of thing. And uh, they're also less preoccupied with pain, if they've got pain, or with discomfort that might be associated with chemotherapy or the cancer itself. Um, less anxiety in general. And um, like I say, that's been repeated many times. And in fact, the first studies of this kind of thing were done back in the 1960s, uh, primarily using LSD, but some work has been done with psilocybin since then. Uh, so we can go from that to just major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression, which are two of the uh, current emphasized areas of, of research. And uh, Olga discussed that. The Food and Drug Administration actually asked people who are researching psilocybin to put together clinical trials to study it because it's their belief that these may be much more effective than the, the standard fare of um, SSRIs and tricyclics and other types of antidepressant medications that uh, people pretty much have to take forever. Um, oddly enough, uh, it doesn't just stop at depression and quality of life and cancer. Addictions can also be treated pretty well with this. There's, there's one drug uh, that's uh, under study, particularly for addiction. It's called Ibogaine. It's uh, an African plant, and, or it's derived from an African plant. Uh, and it's particularly effective, it seems, with uh, alcohol, but possibly with other kinds of addictive substances as well. And so the group at Hopkins, for example, has found uh, considerable success with smoking. Uh, tobacco is one of the more difficult addictions to disrupt, to interfere with. And uh, all smoking cessation programs are typically um, somewhere about 5 to 15% effective after a year. So very few people really maintain their abstinence from smoking after participating in one of these programs, even when they're helped by certain drugs or nicotine patches or that kind of thing. In the Hopkins study, they found that uh, roughly 70% of 
people who had been uh, moderately heavy, long-term smokers, uh, were still abstinent after a year. So that, that's a very impressive kind of outcome. Uh, alcohol is another area um, that is um, the focus of some research. Uh, most of the research on alcohol was done uh, a number of years ago using LSD for a number of reasons. People have switched primarily to psilocybin. It doesn't last quite as long. It's not quite as intense. Um, while both are considered to be very safe, psilocybin is considered even safer than LSD. Uh, and so it's fallen to psilocybin now to, to be the treatment for these addictions. There is a study of cocaine addiction that's underway. And uh, one of the things a lot of people have expressed interest in, especially because in the uh, United States, there is a significant problem with opioid dependence is whether this will work with opioids. And uh, again, some older research done with LSD uh, suggests that LSD definitely was. And because the two are so similar in many respects, uh, it seems like it would be a, an excellent idea to, to begin to, to study that. And in fact, that's, that's one of the things I've discussed with colleagues of, of mine. In addition to uh, being involved in the, the New York University study, um, I'm working with uh, people at NYU and at the University of Colorado uh, to try to get funding to look at uh, cancer patients. Uh, we're looking for that funding from the National Institutes of Health and in particular, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, our project has been reviewed and sent back. We need to make some revisions and resubmit it. But uh, we've gotten a lot of encouraging comments from uh, people who are on the staff at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and so we're hopeful that that will work. But one of the other things that we've discussed is the, the use of psilocybin in treating addiction to opioids. So you, you can wonder what is similar about those. Um, Olga mentioned uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, at Yale University, there's a study underway with people who have cluster headaches and uh, other work. Uh, in particular in Europe, is apparently uh, in the planning stages to deal with other types of headaches, uh, more with uh, kind of classic migraines in particular. Um, one study that uh, has uh, taken place recently is one of group therapy using psilocybin for demoralization among people who have had AIDS for uh, a long time. And um, so that's very interesting, both for the, the population and um, the use of psilocybin for, for treating that. So the important thing here then is what is the mechanism? What's going on in order to make this possible? And uh, it's, it's more than we can get into today, but um, uh, some research that I've done um, with another drug that's, that's related to psilocybin, uh, MDMA, or um, this is the actual name of it, 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine. Um, it's been used for um, a, a number of different kinds of problems, and it's, it's been around really for quite a long time. It was first uh, patented in 1912, and uh, that was by the German pharmaceutical company Merck. Uh, but then Merck abandoned it. They were, they were looking for something that would um, um, facilitate uh, clotting. And um, they just thought that it wasn't very useful for that purpose. But it, it resurfaced in the 70s and uh, became really widely used until 1985 when the federal government uh, uh, in the US banned it. Um, but what's interesting is uh, a lot of psychiatrists and uh, other mental health people continued to use it uh, for a number of different purposes over time. 
Well, we were involved in a phase two clinical trial uh, where we administered to people with treatment resistant PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, what we found was a very significant improvement from two or three sessions of MDMA. It would last about five to six hours. Um, people would also receive psychotherapy before and in between their sessions. But uh, of this group who had been treated with all kinds of different uh, medications and therapies, um, at the end of the study, and then after a one-year follow-up, we found that 76% of the sample still um, had no, uh, they did not meet the criteria in the psychiatric uh, diagnostic manual for post-traumatic stress. So uh, very significant improvements with that population. Uh, I worked with a colleague of mine at the University of Colorado to try to understand the mechanism, what's involved in that. And so we did an animal trial using rats and uh, fear learning in rats. And we found that um, MDMA works by a very specific kind of mechanism that essentially allows change in memory itself. Uh, and in particular, in, in memories of really painful emotions, the kinds of things that people might experience in a, a traumatic event. So our thinking is that this may be the case as well for um, psilocybin, that because it works so quickly and because its effects last so long, um, it, it seems likely that we could be affecting the memories themselves Psilocybin has a number of things going for it. As Olga said, it's very safe. There's no medical toxicity, no potential for addiction, and people develop a tolerance to it fairly quickly when they take the kinds of doses that would create a, a psychedelic sort of experience. Uh, you don't see tolerance developing with microdosing, however. Uh, so uh, it's also got no toxic effects on any organ system, including the brain. Uh, it doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't cause birth defects. It's not associated with overdose, death, overdose deaths. Um, the main side effect of it is a brief, mild increase in heart rate and blood pressure when it's taken in larger doses. Uh, but that has not been problematic in any of the clinical trials or other research that's been done. And, it's estimated that of the over a thousand doses administered in Europe and the US in clinical research uh, over the last 25 or 30 years, there have been no serious adverse events, but subjects were carefully screened. So uh, it's, it's thought not to be a good idea for people with psychoses or severe personality disorders to, to be treated casually with uh, uh, psilocybin, but it, it looks effective otherwise. Um, some people have brief anxiety or panic attacks. Um, in particular, that's likely to happen if they're taking it in an unsupervised recreational setting. Uh, but with the large doses, uh, some anxiety is often a part of the therapeutic process. So it's not really a um, a negative side effect. It's just something that happens as part of the way it works. So microdosing, I, I apologize if I'm repeating um, what Olga said, but I, I had something earlier and joined this call a little bit late. They also call it subdosing. Usually it's about two to 10% of the usual dose, two to three times a week, sometimes for weeks or months. Uh, and it's reportedly been done by a lot of different people, including Albert Hoffman, who is the chemist who synthesized LSD and who first synthesized um, psilocybin for, for Sandoz. Uh, other people have been involved in it too. Hoffman is an interesting guy. He died at the age of 104. And he once said that he did microdosing twice weekly for the last several decades of his life. So... I think he said four or five decades. 
Um, a lot of people feel it's very helpful, but there have been no clinical trials using uh, any substance of microdosing. It's, it's been uh, uh, a difficult thing to figure out how to do it. Um, so there's a fair amount that's been said about it and written about it. Um, it's thought to be uh, um, very beneficial, though, in certain respects. Uh, you get these reports of improved mood, energy level, thinking clearly. Uh, it's even safer than the regular doses. Uh, and it has no acute psychedelic effects. So what that means is um, people don't require a long session of five or six hours with a therapist or often two therapists. Instead, uh, they could do it on their own, presumably work, uh, interact with people. And if anything, they, they feel like their, their functioning during that time is improved. And it's inexpensive, uh, much less expensive than the way psilocybin is typically administered and used. Uh, I talked about that. Um, so, you know, what we are discussing, I'm involved in part of this um, uh, projected program of research for weight, but um, there's one study that's uh, somewhat larger that's going to look at emotional and psychological outcomes of microdosing because no one has done that. Whether or not people routinely have these uh, beneficial effects or it's just a placebo effect needs to be demonstrated. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking that I may be involved with a smaller trial with maybe 40, 50 participants. Uh, might last eight to 12 weeks, somewhere in there. Maybe eight weeks would be sufficient time. And we look at the effects on depressive symptoms, quality of life. Uh, but I think it would also be interesting to look at cognitive abilities, so people's short-term memory, their ability to pay attention, that sort of thing. Uh, probably assess people uh, at the beginning and at the end, and maybe in the, the middle too, so four to six weeks after the uh, microdosing has begun. Uh, and we'd, we'd also like to use functional brain imaging, so functional MRI. There's a structure in the brain called the amygdala that has been found to be uh, very much involved in fear, anxiety, emotional learning, anger. Um, changes in the activity of amygdala have been found in post-traumatic stress disorder and in successful treatment. Uh, and in particular with some of the uh, successful treatment with the LSD or psilocybin, it appears that the relationship between the amygdala and other parts of the brain changes and that activity changes in the amygdala. So it's, it's possible to kind of look at the, the brain basis of how these things work. So I think that's uh, pretty well covering what I, I wanted to address for you. So I'd be glad to answer questions later too. Sure. Um, thank you, Professor Grigsby. Just want to remind everyone as you uh, give thought to your questions that you in fact pose them in the Q&A section and not necessarily in the chat section. I mean, we welcome the chat in terms of general comments, but as it relates to questions that you need to have addressed, I'm inviting you to pose those questions in the Q&A section on Zoom panel. So again, thanks, um, Professor Grisby. I am no expert on, on all this, but um, clearly a lot of research work uh, is being done, as you have shared, and, and you know, with, with what seemed to be very positive impact, impact on the quality of life of cancer patients, you know, the addictions, the treatment of you know, post-traumatic stress disorders and other related kind of mental illnesses. So with that, what I want to do at this point in time is turn to our local panel. Our next segment is our, our local panel um, to deal with the clinical trials and uh, psilocybin potential in Jamaica. And for that segment, I have with me uh, this morning, Professor Wendell Abel, who is a consultant psychiatrist and therapist 
over 25 years um, in you know, providing counseling services on cognitive behavior therapy, drug counseling, marital counseling, etc. So Dr. Professor Abel is going to lead the, the segment, the panel discussion. And again, I invite your question, um, you know, in, pose your questions in the Q&A section. So with that said, over to you, uh, Professor Abel, to introduce your panel and take it from you. All right, thank you everybody. Um, pleasant day and um, really appreciative of the discussions that um, we had, we've had so far this morning. It really is an exciting opportunity for us to be, to be looking at the psilocybin mushroom. Um, and I mean, listening on to our colleagues, um, actually I was surprised that we've been growing mushroom in Jamaica for this long. I, I didn't really realize even in North Manchester, where I'm from, there was actually great activity and I have to talk to Pauline about it. And we know the, um, the group from WAKE um, Network, who obviously have been doing work here in Jamaica, and we welcome them. Um, on this panel, we have several persons. We have from the University of the West Indies, Professor Roger Gibson. Um, he's the head of the Department of Psychiatry at the University Hospital. He's been he's professor of affective disorder and has been principal investigator in research exploring the use of psilocybin in the treatment of anxiety and depression. So we have been, the interest has been here um, for quite a while. On the panel, we also have Professor Marvin Reed. Marvin is a deputy dean with the Portfolio Responsibility for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and he's the Clinical Trials Guru in the faculty here. Um, so welcome, Marvin. Should also acknowledge Professor Rupika Delgoda. Um, she's a head of the Natural um, Product Institute and has been doing extraordinary work in natural products in Jamaica. And um, she also has an interest in research in psilocybin. And um, I think one of the areas that she wants to touch on briefly, some of the challenges in terms of the regulatory framework that we need to get going. Um, I also must acknowledge the presence of Dr. Audia Barnett. And Audia um, works, has worked in the public and private sector um, and has done work in oyster mushroom. So welcome panelists, and we know that we only SRC. have, pardon me? SRC. Oh, SRC, oh, sorry, Shara Watson from SRC, I'm sorry. Um, uh, welcome, sorry, we, we, Shara, that's your name, that's how you pronounce your name, right? We want to welcome you because we know that the Scientific Research Council plays a critical role. So we only have a short time for this section, 24 minutes, I'm told, we need to keep our time um, as best as possible to give people opportunity for Q&A. So um, let, me, let me just questions out, and I probably ask Rupika in terms of what are some of the challenges you see moving forward in terms of the regulatory challenges we could have? Uh, thank you, Professor Abel, and the opportunity to be able to be a part of this um, exciting webinar. I really enjoyed all the speakers before us. Um, as we embark on research in psilocybin mushroom, it's a new field for us. Um, we, we are very excited to be involved in the basic science uh, of it, um, understanding and optimizing growth conditions for all the different strains of mushrooms. There are over hundreds of psilocybin producing mushrooms and understanding the biochemistry behind them, their, their biosynthetic pathways and really understanding chemistry is um, what we're really interested in at this stage. But what we are also very keen to do is to develop methodology um, to be able to set standards for this particular field. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that in 2018, the Jamaican government gave approval for natural health products, NHPs, um, also sometimes known as nutraceuticals, to be recognized for the first time as a separate category in the country um, within the Food and Drug Act. 
uh, and these amendments are currently taking place. So medicinal mushroom products are likely therefore to be part of these NHPs. And the Ministry of Health that um, regulates um, food and drugs currently have a very rigorous um, process in place to be able to recognize a new product that comes to market. There is a need to provide standardizations, which is very, very important in this particular field. Um, whatever we produce have to be understood to have the, uh, a particular recognized amount of the bioactive molecules in there. We have to provide a level of proof and efficacy, and of course, a proof of quality. This means perhaps the absence of pesticides, mycotoxins, and any other things, um, and, and, and safety. Safety in that that particular formulation that's provided um, is safe for human consumption, whether it is provided as an extract or a capsule or however it is produced at that stage. Uh, that needs to have levels of, um, you know, proof of safety um, in the manner that it is presented. So the Ministry of Health has fairly rigorous process to, to ensure that the safety of the Jamaican people and for the approval of a, dr a new drug entity um, coming in with proof or the launch of clinical trials, they would require these certain standards to be met. And so we're very keen to ensure that this industry develops the right standards for safety and efficacy. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, um, Prof. Delgado. Um, Audio, my question to you, you've been, you're working in um, both public private sector and um, you're one of the persons working with um, WIC Network um, as an advisor. Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. going forward as we begin to develop this industry and to develop products and so on. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thanks to Jampro for accommodating this session. So we know that Jamaica signed the UN Convention for Psychotropic uh, Substances way back um, some 20 odd years ago, or maybe 30 years ago. And, as, and, and this has psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms as one of the one of the schedule one substances. So that means a controlled substance. And we, cognizant of that, realize that the domestic regulation will now be of great interest. It means that we have to look at the Ministry, and Rupika mentioned it, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has been a key player in terms of the, the regulatory framework. But there are several other ministries that will be involved. We have the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. We have the Ministry of Agriculture, as well as even Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Um, the, 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 we, we, have, we have operated for many years on a silo basis, and we need to break down some of these silos and have a discussion. And this, this seminar, this webinar, is an excellent start in having this discussion and ensuring that for each jurisdiction, the requirements have been, have been met. So we talk about food safety, but we also talk about the, the efficacy and the, and, and the safety for human um, consumption. So, so these are some of the things that um, I think the Weight Network and Weight Jamaica is very, very um, committed to, 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 to making sure that we keep our eye on the ball and, 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 and do the requisite uh, checks and balances so that we do this properly. We have learned a lot of lessons from the cannabis story, and we want to make sure that we do this properly. Thank you very much for those comments. In fact, while you were speaking, that's exactly what I was thinking, that um, lots of lessons were learned from cannabis. And, um, and that is why I think this discussion and meeting of minds is so important for us to appreciate the pitfalls and the promises and for us all to be talking with each other. It's very important that we don't operate in silos, you know? So even as a university, we recognize that bound must go to town and we have to begin to talk and collaborate and, you know, 
work with industry and the wider community. And we're mindful of that reality. So at this point in time, I'll ask um, Ms. Watson from the um, Scientific Research Council to just highlight the opportunities and the role of the council moving forward. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for um, having us participate in this very important discussion. Um, first, I want to send apologies on behalf of Dr. Riley, who is participating in a ministry meeting with the new minister. So that's why I'm filling in, filling in for him. As it relates to the Scientific Research Council, um, one of our primary mandates, of course, is, support, is to support industry and support um, agriculture and provide that um, scientific background that will support natural products or products such as um, psilocybin or um, nutraceuticals, so to speak. Um, so we are a scientific entity and some of the activities that the University of West Indies are doing um, would, would also fall within mm -hmm. our purview as well. But our main focus is really to support um, industry as well as the regulatory body being a government entity. So we are heavily um, focused on looking at developing or enhancing method for quantification, identification of the active compounds so that that support can be given once that industry is um, set up. It can't, it can't be a case where um, access to um, resources or um, medium to assess the material or the products coming from this particular industry is limited. Um, so SRC sees itself having an important role to support both the government in, regu in the regulation of products such as these, as well as supporting industry. So we are heavily looking at what the profile of the, the mushrooms in Jamaica are, um, looking at identity and classification of the particular strains. Are there any unique strains here to, in Jamaica? What are the chemical constituents? Apart from the active ingredients, are there other components in the material that might be giving a synergistic effect? Um, so those are the kind of research perspective that we're looking at, as well as ensuring that we're able to support the industry at the level that it will need in order to have a properly functioning industry. We don't want the same thing happen with cannabis, where persons have material, can't test it, so material can't move because we have those kind of limitations. We want to avoid that, and SRC has an important role to play in that, and that's where our focus is at the moment. Thank you, and thanks for highlighting the, your capacity in terms of supporting regulation, industry, and also academia. Um, because we do know that the SRC has vast resources and we certainly look forward to see more stronger collaboration between SRC and the University of the West Indies. Now at this time I'll turn to Professor Gibson to ask him what are the opportunities um, for doing research in Jamaica. I mean, um, previous speakers have alluded to research that has been done elsewhere. And how do you see the landscape? Do you see great opportunities here? Prof Gibson? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Wendell. So yes, I do see great opportunities here, as was pointed out in the earlier part of the webinar. Um, mushroom growing is um, an activity that has taken off in Jamaica. So that means that we have the, um, the raw product, so to speak, um, with which we can um, make uh, drugs suitable for uh, research in, in, in the context of clinical trials. Here in Jamaica, we also have a fairly high uh, prevalence of depression, 20% prevalence rate of depression. Anxiety prevalence is estimated to be around about the same. So we have uh, persons who have conditions uh, for which uh, psilocybin has a lot of potential for. In addition, because of the presence of institutions like the University of the West Indies, we do have experience in carrying out this kind of research. <clears throat> and we also have the clinical backing to make sure that um, research is carried out in an appropriate fashion and that the safety of 
uh, purchase of funds is, is, uh, is ensured. All right, thanks very much. And as a practicing psychiatrist myself, I must add that I've been approached um, over the past by, by a few patients, especially those who've had uh, resistant depression, who've been asking if um, they can have access to psilocybin mushrooms. So the reality is that we do have a patient population. We do have patients who are interested in the whole process. And so we need to, to, to accelerate the whole process in terms of research and development of product um, and not make the same mistakes that we did with marijuana, where with cannabis, right? Where, where um, I don't, I mean, I'm disappointed. And what has happened with cannabis is that window of opportunity closed quickly on us. I hope it doesn't close as quickly on us with the psilocybin mushroom. And we begin to see what is happening in places like Canada. Now, one of the challenges we've always had, apart from challenges, challenges in terms of developing products, um, one of the challenges we face is actually doing our clinical trials, which is really a critical process and an expensive process. And I'm going to ask uh, Reed to address this. Um, what does he see as some of the challenges? How are we going to be able to accelerate the process and so on? So Prof, um, Reed, kindly um, address some of those issues. Thanks. Good day, colleagues. Um, uh, I, I was initially asked to produce or to give a brief overview of um, uh, uh, the clinical trials um, in the university or um, in the university setting. Um, so I start with that first and then I, I will close by, by just trying to answer briefly um, Professor Abel's um, question. Sure. So, sorry? No, say sure. Go ahead. Excellent. Right, right. So, so the World Health Organization defines a clinical trial as any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to a health intervention, and the goal of that really is to evaluate some effect on on health outcome. So, your intervention can be any uh, material or a strategy that you actually use um, to try and see whether or not it will have an effect on, on your outcome. For the purposes of therapeutic agents, um, typically the industry classifies them into four phases. Phase one, the goal of that really is to determine whether or not the, the treatment is safe. Um, and so a lot of that is based on safety and trying to ascertain what's the appropriate dosage to be used. Phase two really um, assesses whether or not there is any indication for the medication. Does the treatment work? Um, if it is given for a particular condition, does it alter it in the way you would expect it to do? And an important consideration is really to ascertain how the drug is distributed within the human body, what we call pharmacokinetics. Then phase three is really to get further proof of the efficacy. So you want to see whether or not the treatment that you're proposing is better than anything that is available um, as we speak. And usually once it is that you've done your phase three trial, you have your drug registered by the appropriate registering body within your jurisdiction, and then it becomes publicly available. A phase four trial really says after the drug becomes publicly available, are there any additional concerns that may emerge because of the use of the drugs? In a sense, what's the performance of the drug in real life or real world um, situation? Um, and a major component of that, the technical term, is um, whether or not you have an appropriate pharmacovigilance mechanism to assess these particular um, effects. So when we're thinking about a clinical trial, there's certain prerequisites that needs to be established in place in order for it to run effectively. So clinical trials can only, be, can only take place where you have an appropriate regulator environment. 
So in the Jamaican context, we have <clears throat> two main ethical committees, which is the Mono Research Ethics Committee, which is what governs research for faculty and students at the University of the West Indies Mono. And then you have the Ministry of Health and Wellness, um, their panel on ethics and medical legal affairs, who is responsible for um, examining the ethical concerns of uh, research proposals within the country. It's important that you get um, uh, their blessing, meaning that their approval, because that is necessary for the importation of any investigational agent within country, if it needs to be imported. Um, in addition to that, oftentimes, many manufacturers or sponsors would wish to have their drugs registered internationally. So not just registered within the local setting, but internationally. And within that context, we normally would perform the drugs, um, perform the studies um, at a standard that will allow um, either FDA approval, which is what it is for US, or the European Medicine Agency, which is it, what you need for approval in the Europe. Um, the other thing that you need is an appropriate site, an appropriate site with the appropriate infrastructure and standard operating procedures that will allow you to perform the studies um, at the standard required. Um, certainly at the University of the West Indies, we have two main sites that we use, um, which is the Faculty of Medical Science Clinical Trial Center and the Caribbean Institute for Health Research, um, their centers over there. You need the appropriate human resource to be able to carry the trials out, and there are certain competences that they need. At the basic minimum, they should be certified in GCP, which is good clinical practice, and RCR, which is responsible um, research um, conduct, responsible conduct of research. Um, you need the appropriate administrative resources as well as the appropriate legal framework. Um, the appropriate financial resources need to be in place to, um, because clinical trials are, are expensive undertaken. Um, you need the appropriate informatics and biostatistical support. Um, you will need to have, the, the site implementing it will have to have an appropriate clinical trial governance structure. And of course, the trial needs to be registered at one of the internationally accepted clinical trial repository. In, in the Jamaican context, um, most of our trials are registered with clinicaltrials.gov. So that's really what the environment entails. So I, on, on my slide on the right-hand side, you'll see where I've put essentially, um, there is a tripartite kind of relationship between a site um, that is performing the clinical trial and the various major entities that are involved, which are the regulator entities, the sponsors who would like the product to be assessed, and, and the, the various monitors who would assess and audit the trial to ensure that it complies with the respective regulations under which it is operating. So in my final slide, I've really just said that certainly where we, where we sit at the University of the West Indies, we have a wide range of experience performing various trials of various varying complexity and in various phases. So we have done vaccine trial that had led to registration of um, IPs. Um, so for example, the, the rotavirus vaccine. We have done phase one trials, including um, first in man studies. So first in man studies are, this is the first time that a human is going to receive the agent. Um, we have worked with psychoactive materials before. We have worked with cannabis. We have worked with materials such as MP4, carbon monoxide. And we have done a full share, a full range of phase two and phase three trials. Um, and I've just listed three of the more recent ones that we have participated in in this particular slide. So in summary, um, uh, the, the point I would wish to make is really that when it comes to the infrastructure, to be able to assess any IP agent um, for registration um, or for clinical efficacy um, or for academic reasons, we have the infrastructure, experience, and talent to be able to do such a trial. Uh, Professor Abel asked me as well to address what are some of the potential um, pitfalls um, or challenges that we face. The, the major one really has to do with um, the, the sponsors not being clear of, of what it is that they wish to have done. Um, and those who are clear 
or sometimes are underfunded because of the fact that they don't realize the expense um, or the steps or the procedures that is required to actually perform a clinical trial at um, a, a particular standard. We have not had, in the trials that we have participated in, we have not had issues with accruals, nor have we had issues um, with uh, what we consider significant or serious adverse reactions. Um, where some of the weaknesses are um, relates to primarily to the regulatory environment. Um, but um, we have devised strategies to work with our regulators to ensure that for the most part, we are able to meet um, our trial objectives um, on time. So that's where it, uh, I will close for this particular um, presentation. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, Reed, for a succinct um, presentation, certainly highlighted a number of issues with the clinical trial. But I think what is also um, what is also clear from your presentation is that the University of the West Indies does have a history and does have the capacity to do clinical trials and has a willingness to collaborate with, with sponsors and other interests. So thanks again. Now, what a wonderful panel this has been because we've actually completed our delivery within time. And so I'm going to turn over to the two persons so that you can open the Q&A section. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Abel. Uh, so listen, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly go into the questions, and I want to assure, uh, you know, all our participants, um, you know, viewers on online, that uh, your questions will be answered, even if they are not answered as part of the session. We'll make note of the questions, and and Jampro will facilitate the answering of these sessions, some of these questions, post the session if they are not you don't get an opportunity to have them address. Now that said, um, the, the first one, uh, which I think is appropriately so, we're talking about psilocybin uh, in Jamaica. We wanted us first to ascertain the legal status of it, primarily in Jamaica. And you know, we can talk about other parts of the world, but I think a, a primary focus is having a clear sense as to the legal status of psilocybin here in Jamaica. and. Um, Prof, I don't know, Professor Wendell here, but I don't know if you can help direct me. I think uh, Professor Buda probably might be able to address that. Okay. Sorry, did, did you say? Professor, Ru Professor Rupika, is she still with us or? Uh, Professor Rupika, right. Oh, I'm not sure if I can give be the right person to answer this accurately, but I think as far as I'm concerned, um, Jamaica is, has, has signed on to the convention um, that has made psilocybin um, a banned, banned substance in the rest of the world. But we have not, as far as I'm concerned, enacted on it. Now, I might be using the wrong terms here. The Minister of Health Regulatory um, Authority is the right person to answer this. Um, but um, the mushroom, the use of psilocybin mushroom, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, you, you, the use of it is not considered illegal here. Okay. If I could add to perfect. Yeah, all right, go ahead. Let her. Go ahead. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to, to, to concur. The, the convention doesn't have the teeth to, to enact. Uh, so, so the convention is an overarching umbrella. And at the domestic level, countries now would weigh in. So it's not illegal. But I think with the new interest um, coming from the international um, parties, I think Jamaica is now looking to see how best regulations could be put in place so that we, 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 um, we have products that are safe and, uh, and, and that all the, the, the concerns associated with a Schedule 1 uh, drug have been addressed. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks for that response. Um, I see uh, one of our, our panelists saying that we need to make sure uh, we, we, can't, uh, we can't be guessing um, you know, uh, almost implying that's the first mistake that we made um, with, with, with cannabis. And I'm going to come back to the 
the cannabis question and the lessons that we've learned there because I'm, I'm seeing a good question on that. But in terms of um, the, the, an idea to want to get a sense as to the total achievable market available specifically for Jamaica producers uh, around uh, you know, what we're trying to do here at Mushroom, I, I don't know, Pauline, if, if in your work you would be able to uh, comment on that any at all? What is the demand that we can be? I think this is one that I'd like uh, Nick to address as the Canadian, the CEO of Wake Network, because he has a very good grasp on the, the market size and, and just where, the, uh, where it's all going. Nick? I think we Hi, may Nick. have... I think we Hi, everyone. Go ahead, Nick. Hey there. Um, thank you, Pauline, Terry. It's, um, it's been an interesting one, and working with the various uh, levels of government, especially the Ministry of Health and Wellness, uh, it's been clear that it, they are a signatory to the UN Convention, um, and despite it not being in the criminal or penal code with regards to cultivation or possession or trafficking of psilocybin mushrooms, that it is indeed uh, treated as such with a Schedule One classification uh, currently. Now, we do see from Canada specifically that that was also a signatory to the Psychotropic Convention um, in 1971 with the UN, that there are paths uh, beyond, uh, specifically in the medical and the research areas. So Canada recently gave a, a exemption to four, initially anyway, four end of life participants in a, uh, a push to our health minister. And it wasn't a Supreme Court challenge, but it was a health minister uh, sign off to give these, these four patients that are suffering from end of life anxiety, the opportunity to use psilocybin legally. Now, since then, there have been a number of others that have also benefited from this. And, uh, and that's thanks to Theracil, a nonprofit based in Victoria, Canada. So there are paths beyond the convention to allow for participants and patients to, to access this medicine legally. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just, just to, to add to that, that question, um, clarifying is, you know, what kind of demand for what can be produced in Jamaica and either exported readily or sold locally, um, your seed, if you could, you know, give us a sense of that. So that's where the business opportunity is. Absolutely. Yeah, so currently exporting psilocybin is, is really a, a research only opportunity. Uh, we do expect that, that it will grow as the various uh, areas and jurisdictions do approve medicinal mushrooms, especially psilocybin for uh, therapeutic for medicinal use. So it's really currently a more of a domestic um, for research purposes production, but we are, we are focused on really nailing our production to make sure that it's GMP standards as well as can be replicable. Most important is that we can create a product that is the same uh, within a 5% variance between batches, and that is number one. Again, we do support a number of other functional mushrooms, and those are fully able to be exported with, um, with plant quarantine, Ministry of Health and Wellness's approval. And those, after testing with our partners at UWE, uh, go up to our secondary partners in California who then test again and bottle and, and sell online. Okay. All right, thanks, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, next one up for you, Pauline, a uh, couple of years. Um, you know, there's a question of how can I get involved in mushroom production? I'm a farmer and an agriculture student living in Mandeville. And in the same breath, can you just say, you know, apart from JAMPRO, is there any other NGO? Uh, is, firstly, is your organization an NGO? And is there any other government agency uh, involved in any way in, in what you're doing? Thank you for that question, Norman. Um, we belong to a, a collection of organizations um, I'm involved with the Network of Women for Food Security that started this whole thing. 
but we do have a membership organization called the Association of Mushroom Producers that anybody can join. Uh, part of what was attractive to Wake Network was the fact that we also have a foundation. The Mushroom Development Foundation is located in, in Manchester. Uh, and so there is a, there's a whole collection that support underpins Wake Jamaica Limited. Um, so there is a place for everybody. The, the women have their group, uh, regular farmer who wants to be part of the solution can join the Association of Mushroom Producers. There isn't a lot of other organizations, unfortunately. Uh, because we started the game, uh, we have been able to populate that model where social enterprise sits at the core of all of this. When we started, we got some support from USAID and the SEBI program as to how to build out the Jamaica mushroom industry as a social enterprise. So that is written in the DNA of what um, Wake Network invested in. Okay. Um, in 2018, Mr. Alvin Murray was running a program called Propel that um, also had some interaction with SRC and other agencies. And he did some important work to spread mushroom cultivation across the island and gave out some uh, tools and organized with SRC and other agencies some training opportunities. Unfortunately, that work was left unfinished when the Propel program, which was sponsored by uh, a Canadian NGO, ended and wasn't renewed. So I think part of this conversation has to be calling on um, the agencies like ECA, like other people and having that conversation about how RADA can participate in creating training, helping us to create training opportunity that would include a lot more people. Unfortunately for our effort, because I had to leave the island to go to Canada to get a brand new hip so I could keep up with the demand of the work, we had a little bit of a hitch. And because I'm, I'm like two weeks post surgery of, uh, of, of getting a revision um, operation. So we've had a little hitch and then we had to step sideways in order to build our new facility that could meet the demand. So at the moment, construction is very, very big, but we are taking names and numbers and I will be back on the island in a few weeks and we'll be very excited to meet with uh, anyone who wants to participate. I have someone assigned to jamaicamushrooms at gmail.com. Send your inquiry to jamaicamushrooms at gmail.com dot com and someone will answer you and get you listed in the loop so you can be part of the solution if you're a group of women or you're an individual who wants to play in this game we are very open to, to finding space for the rural farmer yeah. all right Th thanks for that um terry um just just uh one here um this was directed to um this was directed uh, coming out of Terry presentation. Uh, does, does mushroom depends on certain type of climate condition to be grown successfully in Jamaica? Well, that's a complicated answer because like I said in my presentation, Jamaica as a, as a growing uh, space is very unique. There is mushrooms that will grow at every different microclimate in Jamaica. What you have to do and where we are lucky is that we have a Jamaican mycologist with a wealth of, of, of understanding of how it works on the farm. And he has been able to develop some IP 
uh, as to how we use the substrates that's available in Jamaica to make mushroom work. So what we've been able to do with the support of Wake Network is to match the mushroom with the area where it's going to be grown. So the kind of mushroom that I would distribute to my to the micro farmers in St. Anne, where we have a micro farmer development center that has been supported by Environmental Fund of Jamaica and Food for the Poor, those ladies would not get the same strain of mushrooms that I would give to the ladies in Christiana, where we are up higher and it's cooler, and you would not give that same mushroom to the ladies in Pepper. So what we've been doing is matching the variety of mushroom, the strain of mushroom with the microclimate of where the farmer is. And, that's, and, and with that kind of a system, you eliminate having a lot of uh, failures. Our system is set up that the end farmer, just like what Hypro does, doesn't get a grow bag until that grow bag is ready to produce in three days. It only takes three days from, the sh from when a mushroom shows up as a baby mushroom to when it is harvested. And we hold those grow bags on the farm in North Manchester until it's ready and distribute it to the farmer when they have three to five days to wait for that. So um, that is, that's what makes our system a little bit different. We have been mimicking the high pro poultry model where the, the, the backyard farmer, the artisan farmer, the small person gets the type of grow bag that matches their microclimate. And having Dr. Audio Barnett, which for me is so exciting because she's still the only woman I know who has a PhD in mushroom cultivation. Uh, so we do have the technical know-how on our team to make sure we skip some of the mistakes that a lot of farmers make. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Terry. And you have provided some useful information around Mushroom Development Foundation, where you know people can get into that and get additional information out of Manchester, and then to also send their emails to Jamaica Mushroom at gmail.com. Um, in terms of the therapy itself, there is a lot of divided opinion on whether or not it is advantageous for facilitators to be closed along with the participant. I've seen for myself where it does help with providing empathy towards a participant and also a common level ground, if you will. I'd love to hear you, you know, what, what you, know, you, you think about this as it relates to this debate. And so clearly, you know, I, I'll ask one of the guys, uh, the, the psychotherapist, um, to, to respond to that. Uh, you could help direct me, uh, Professor Abel, or if you yourself could respond to that. Um, is Prof. Reed here? Yes, I'm still here. Yes, you, you probably might be better able to. Um, Sorry, could you just repeat that one? Okay, so this is from a, this is from a, I'm, I'm reading verbatim from a, you know, a participant on, on the session. Uh, in terms of the therapy itself, there's a lot of divided opinion on whether or not it's advantageous for facilitators to be ah. closed, uh, to be dosed uh, along with the participant, right? I've seen for myself where it does help with providing empathy towards a participant and also a quote unquote common level ground. I love to hear you and what you think as it relates to this debate. All right, so that, that speaks to, to a design issue. It, it really depends on what your outcome of your research work um, is going to be. Um, certainly for most of, um, most research that is going to be used for drug approval, um, that's, that design would not be recommended because it removes a lot of what we consider to be the, the impartiality 
that you need in making endpoint determinations. Um, so so as, a, as a research design per se, um, it's not something that we would necessarily do if it is that you're looking for an approval process. Um, so so that, that's, that's basically what it is that I would, would, would wish to say on, on, on the matter. Okay. Professor, right, and I since I'll have you on the floor. To speak to this. Go, I'm sorry, Norman. Go I ahead. Think go maybe, ahead. Per, um, maybe Professor Grigsby could uh, speak to this. Okay, yeah, I can say a bit. I think as a general rule, most of the people who are involved in this kind of research um, would be rather reluctant to go along with both for the concerns uh, Professor Reed mentioned with respect to research design and um, uh, out of concern that uh, uh, although it may not happen every time uh, and sometimes it may be that empathy is facilitated by the facilitator um, also taking a, a dose um, for the most part, I think there are concerns that it might compromise the ability of the facilitator to um, engage properly with the, the participant. And um, my own sense of it is that, um, that, that if that's done, that's something that should be done very cautiously. And Norman, if I could speak to that. So MAPS, one of the organizations uh, very active in psychedelic research and probably one that we owe this renaissance of psychedelic research to, has a training program specifically designed for therapists who will be working with participants. So they can themselves in training environment um, undergo and undergo this treatment modality and know what future participants would be experiencing. So they, in a way, can be on the same page, but not at the same time, of course. Okay, um, thanks, thanks for that clarity. Um, as lesson learned from the cannabis uh, experience, it was mentioned a number of times. Uh, what would you say are the main missteps from that experience which we now need to um, to avoid. You you want me to? Yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Some of the one of the lessons, a big one, is um, we are we operated too much in silos. Yes, and industry, university, government, and so on. We're all siloed and didn't come together properly. As a result, a major challenge we face is that I'm still not clear in terms of the whole regulatory framework. And I think it's going to be a challenge we face because if we notice the Ministry of Health Wellness is not present here, not knocking them. I know they have the COVID, COVID crisis to deal with, but um, they're going to be critical to the process um, in terms of facilitating the whole regulation. And I see that as a major challenge and a gap. Um, another challenge we're going to face is, and it kind of surfaces morning in terms of clarity, in terms of the legal status of psilocybin mushroom, because it still is very, it's nebulous, you know, because although we are signatory to the various convention, including the convention on psychotropic substances of 71, where it's a schedule one, um, when you look at our Dangerous Drug Act, it speaks to raw and prepared opium. It speaks to ganja. We've since amended it to make accommodation. It speaks to cocaine and morphine. It doesn't speak, to, it doesn't address anything about the psychedelic mushroom. And I think that is a challenge. It's a, great, it's a challenge and an opportunity because it's really not clear in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in our Dangerous Drug Act. Um, and what is also interesting is that the UN at some point had indicated that the psychedelic mushroom is really not under inter and that any plant containing natural plant containing psilocybin is really not under international control. And so as a result of that, what we find um, there are three countries in the world that have laws that are relaxed. One of them is Jamaica, 
the other one is Brazil and I think the Netherlands, yes? So we are in a good position from that point of view because of the nature of our regulation to be out of the box very quickly. But we just have to make sure the regulations are in place. Um, of course, another challenge we, we, we face, and I think Professor Reed alluded to that, it's in terms of mm -hmm. conducting clinical trials. Clinical trials are very expensive, and we have to have the necessary resources to do robust clinical trials. Or so we might be able to develop product, but we're not going to be able to take it to market without the proper clinical trials. All right. Thanks, thanks for that, Professor Abel. Uh, no I, I I think, I think one of the things that I would like to say about what we saw with cannabis and what my farmers have been pushing back on is that there has to be a place at the table for the little guy. It can't be because they're, my own experience is that I have been overwhelmed by the amount of foreign companies that have found their way from Belgium, America, Canada, to my small farm in North Manchester. Some showing up at late night. And it's all about, here is a bag of money, Let, let's do something. But when you get to talk to them, and what made Wake very different is that Wake bought in from the start that the farmers had to be part of the system, that there had to be a seat at the table for, my, for the women, for the youth, for the for where we left the Rasta, the local Rasta man in George North is not benefiting anything from the growth of the cannabis industry. We have, because the artisan knowledge was transferred to women in a decentralized system, the big, the big people coming to Jamaica want to grow mushrooms, but they don't know how to do it in Jamaica. They don't know how to work with our substrate. They don't understand our climate. They don't, they don't have that. And it's individual women sprinkled all over the countryside and young people who carry parts of that um, knowledge. So you need to get together 10 or 20 women in order to run a, a farm. And each of those women and carry a piece of the knowledge. And because of that, people have had to stop and make room for the farmers at the table. And I think it would be really sad if we lock the small guy out of this conversation when for the last decade, they're the ones who've been growing mushrooms. They're the ones who've been supplying the hospitality industry. They're the ones who've been trying to understand magic mushroom versus um, functional mushrooms. And I think we need to make sure there is that seat at the table where the, the, the little farmer sits. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, very much inviting the triple bottom line kind of investment um, to take place. So, so listen, um, you know, I, I guess on that small count, you know, I, I see where somebody asked, you know, um, can I sell mushroom in my legal cannabis herb house in Jamaica as at yet? Um, if I may, just to add to the last, question or the point that was being discussed before. I can't answer the, the, the specific question that's been asked now, but as it relates to the mistakes or missteps that we did as it relates to cannabis that put us in a position to not fully realize what the potentials were from that industry. One of the things that I pray we don't repeat is Operating, we've been saying it all morning, operating in the silos that we have been, which results in regulations being developed that we, the industry can't meet. Um, and I'm speaking specifically as it relates to having parameters set up, having a um, guide that we ought to meet as an industry that, one, we can't assess, or two, we have no, no um, support system to, to meet it. Um, a common example that we experience here often, you have heavy metals um, in, your, in your water or food or ground provision. And based on what the levels are accepted, they are very, they are no, there's, there's no testing facility here in Jamaica that can test to that sensitivity. 
So we want to ensure that once we are setting up anything as it relates to the industry, the proper framework is put in place to support those regulations so that the industry really have a viable chance of having any kind of success. Because if we set regulations that we cannot meet, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so that is one of the things I want to ensure. I hope that we don't repeat, which is one of the things that happened with the cannabis industry. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that, Shara. Uh, the quick question here. Has there been any study that compares isolated psilocybin to a type of whole plant treatment? It seems that we are focused on one compound. One, one compound. Uh, it reminds me of the THC in early research days. I don't know if Dr. Uh, Professor Griggs, uh, Professor Grigsby, uh, want, want to comment on that any at all? Sure. Um, at this point, I don't know of any studies that have been done to directly compare the two. Um, the, uh, the thing that I think of is that uh, uh, in the 1950s, when uh, Gordon Wasson was uh, studying psilocybin, uh, he took some down and gave it to a curandera uh, in South America who he knew named uh, Maria Sabina and uh, she used this in her work and he took synthesized psilocybin and uh, uh, gave it to her and asked her to compare the experience with what she got from the mushrooms and according to her account uh, the main difference was that um, the synthesized version came on a little bit more slowly but otherwise she found it wasn't possible to discriminate between the two. Um, it seems to me pretty clear that there have to be some other uh, compounds in the mushroom, alkaloids uh, that may not be the primary psychoactive ingredient, but they may affect the, the experience in some ways. So um, from the perspective of experience among one person, who uh, uh, had a lot of experience, uh, phenomenologically, there's not a lot of difference, but um, I, I think it needs to be investigated. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, And we at WAVE are uh, geared up to test precisely that. And uh, it seems like to echo what uh, Professor Grigsby had to say, it seems mm -hmm. like psilocybin and psychedelic mushrooms are in quite a different situation than cannabis, whole plant versus THC, either synthetic or isolated is. It seems like the effects of psychedelic mushrooms do primarily rely on psilocybin. Okay, all right, um, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, there's just some, um, uh, Shara, uh, this one appears to be for you. Is there any global standard for mushroom neuro nutraceutical as it relates to pesticides or toxin? And then is our equipment here on island capable of testing to said standard if there are any? Shara of SRC, you, you are, a, are you in a position to comment on that? Well, I can comment on their behalf, I think. Um, I know sure. that he has the capacity to, to test for um, some of those um, pesticides. I know that UWI is set up to test for pesticides um, in the Department of Chemistry. So I think both, both units are. OK. All and right. also, SRC has the capability to actually test for the psilocybin and is actively engaged in, 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 in studies to do that, to analyze mushrooms and to be able to see the, the, the levels of psilocybin and psilocin in these types of mushrooms. Okay. And then just, just a, a, a final, thanks, thanks for the feedback on that. And just a final question here. We are at um, top of the hour, oh, just past uh, our projected uh, end time. Um, Pauline mentioned micro farming training program where is this offered and how can it be accessed by interested persons? I think that's all we have time for. 
All right. Send, send, send your question to tsmith at weight.net or Jamaica Mushrooms at gmail.com. We have different groups of people across the island. At the moment, uh, there's a new microfarma center being opened in Bamboo St. Anne, but there are other things in the work because once we got the market for the mushrooms we produce, we've been able to deploy resources uh, in a lot more communities. So send me an email. And if you lose my email address, just Google, just Google me, Jamaica Mushroom Pauline, and there'll be a number of articles that will come up. I'll be still carrying my walking stick at that point, but I'll get back to you. You'll find me. My I phone number and everything is there. Where are you in Manchester? Well, today I'm in Toronto, but normally I mean, I sit on a range of hill between Christiana and Spalding, overlooking Trelawney, St. Anne, Clarendon, and Manchester. It's Got called you. George North. Okay. I'm in, I'm in uh, Audley Shaw's constituents, man. I'm in, uh -huh. among the bamboo up there. So listen, I, I, uh, as we come to a close, I just want to say thank you to, to all our panelists and, and, and thanks for our participants. Thanks for the questions that you've asked. Uh, we assure you that we will answer those questions or get them answered. Um, you got some information from Pauline Smith, so you'll be able to direct some of your questions uh, there to have them addressed. Uh, from our own position, as I mentioned before, Jampro is always looking for areas in which we can partner and develop uh, in Jamaica and really to take some of these opportunity uh, globally. This is an opportunity I believe uh, that we can uh, you know, benefit from significantly as a country. I uh, wanna avoid some of the mistakes, uh, missteps if you will, from the cannabis industry. You all articulate some of those. And, and we look forward to continuing our work as, as Jampro in supporting uh, this initiative. That said, I just wanna thank you all for your time again and for being here. And um, that's it. Peace out. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Jampro.